Good afternoon on the East Coast. Good morning, um, the rest of the country. My name is Jeff Clayton. I'm one of the vice presidents of the AAS. And I'm very excited about the opportunity to introduce Dr. Jackie Faraday today. Dr. Faraday received her PhD in physics and astronomy from Stony Brook University. She was an NSF fellow at the University of Chile and a Hubble fellow at DTM. Her research interests include properties of brown dwarfs and hot extrasolar planets, kinematics, astrometry, star and planet formation, wolf ray stars, emission line stars, planetary nebulae, machine learning, and scientific visualization of large data sets. And perhaps most importantly, Jackie is one of the discoverers of Manhattan Henge. Um, we're going to start in just a second. Just remember, you can submit your questions, write them into the Q&A, and um, we will answer the questions at the end of the talk. Uh, we're going to have lots of time because we've added 15 minutes to the question period at the end. So please stick around. So um, without further ado, please welcome uh, Jackie Faraday. Thanks, Jeff. And thank you everybody for tuning in wherever you are, whatever time zone you're in. Um, I, I know this is recorded, so some people will be watching from the future. And I, I really hope those of you watching from the future are watching this and seeing that where we are right now is a historic time where we're gonna see some really big changes happening in the way that we treat each other in recovering from a global pandemic and recovering as a better society. So those of you watching from the future, I really hope that you're in the society that we're all hoping we can get to. All right, so let's get started on our dynamic solar neighborhood. A title that I chose because it's some of my favorite things to talk about, things that are close by to the sun. And the solar neighborhood really allows us to investigate in exquisite detail individual sources, as well as small and large kinematic structures at different ages, which shed light on the star and planet formation process. Uh, what's important to say is when I, I talk about the solar neighborhood, I'm referring to 20 to 500 parsecs from the sun, where we can get a clear census on a variety of objects. We can acquire a volume complete census for mass function purposes. And we can investigate some extreme examples of various populations. Let's see if I can make the screen go. Uh, and a focus on the solar neighborhood allows us to investigate intrinsically faint sources in beautiful detail. So like brown dwarfs, these objects which do not have enough mass for stable hydrogen burning, so they just simply cool throughout their lives and they never shine all that bright. They can be evaluated in their number and their density to inform us on the limits of the star and planet formation process. As there, there really is um, a, an important question that um, we can answer with the solar neighborhood as to where does the high mass end of the planet formation begin and the low mass end of the star formation end. And the solar neighborhood, which contains this plethora of stars, brown dwarfs, and giant planets, has just the objects to go after to try and help you answer these questions. So another aspect of this talk, which is important, is that um, I'm very focused on the spatial and velocity distribution of objects. Uh, as a result, I'm going to use a lot of virtual flights for this talk. So your bandwidth is going to be important. And um, if you can be in a darker room, like turn your lights off, that'll help. Also, I know from watching these videos that it's not going to be perfect because even my own bandwidth isn't able to transfer all of the virtual flights I want to take you on. So I'm going to be making all of these videos that you'll see rendered in this talk available so that you can have a look at them in the highest resolution that they should be um, looked at. I'm gonna be using some planetarium software called Open Space throughout, and the logo is on the upper left-hand corner of this slide, which allows me to basically take you on a spaceship, a spaceship of sorts that moves both in space and in time so that we can just look around and investigate the distribution and motions of our nearest neighbors. All right. So this will be the first 
of the um, videos, and this is a setup video, of the picture of how our understanding of the solar neighborhood um, can contain and bring to life the amazing astrometric work that has gone on from space and ground-based programs and the scientific stories that you can tell. So this video, which should begin, will take off from New York City. We're hovering over Central Park here with the American Museum of Natural History in the center stage. As we move away, you'll see the island of Manhattan come to life here. And then Bronx, uh, Queens, Brooklyn first, and then on, on to Long Island. You can, Open Space, this planetarium software is really good for teasing out the structure, planetary structures, and takes you from small things out to large things. And so as we move away from the Earth, we're going to do something that I certainly wish we could do in real life, which is get on the spaceship and fly away from the Earth, away from everything that's happening on Earth, and into our interstellar neighborhood. Um, here we are with the Earth there, and the orbit of the Earth is highlighted with that blue line there. And these are your bright nighttime sky stars, the ones that map out constellations like the lines that I've shown here. At center view is the centaur to give you some orientation with the Southern Cross at maybe your two o'clock here. And that was done on purpose, as I'm going to continue to fly away from the Earth and away from our solar system. Because when you talk about the solar neighborhood, you want to talk about the distribution of objects spatially. In order to do that, you need to map them. You need to know precisely where they are. And the, the positions that are shown in this video as we move away from the glare of the solar system and out to, there goes Alpha Centauri moving, out past a couple parsecs away. Um, you're capturing some of the structure. And this is all mapped by Hipparchos. So what's clear in here is that there's not too many stars that are showing. And that is largely because Hipparchos was a bright star astrometric cataloger. If you're going to try and get to the fainter objects to really beat down the barrier on star to brown dwarf formation uh, and planet to brown dwarf, you need to go fainter than this in the stellar neighborhood. Even still, there goes the Hyades. You see a little bit of kinematic structure. We need to revisit this view um, with a new flight, uh, a new virtual flight that I can take you on now in the era of the Gaia, the European Space Agency's Gaia telescope revolution, which took us from the 118,000 parallaxes that Parkos had to 1.37 billion in the data release two catalog. So a 10,000 fold increase in objects and really helped fill in the distribution of the nearby solar neighborhood so that we can do some volume complete census samples. Let's have a look at what that looks like. And this is certainly a video that's going to challenge your bandwidth. Uh, but bear with me here. This is going to be a flight that takes off from the Earth again. It's going to be a very similar orientation to the one that we were just in, where uh, there's the centaur again at your, you know, two o'clock to your six o'clock with the Southern Cross there, which means that Alpha Centauri is right in front of you. So we're moving away from the solar system again through Hipparchos. And in a moment, I'm going to show on essentially just to impress upon you Gaia DR2 and the vast number of objects that it has mapped and filled in for our solar neighborhood. So we're moving away from the solar system. And as we do, this particular video rendering has just over 7 million stars in it. 7 million stars, which map out the radial velocity sample that Gaia DR2 provided. And so I'm moving away from the solar system and I'm gonna kind of move around it slowly so that you can see what it looks like. Again, to impress upon you the, the, the beauty of what's really close to the sun and visually look around, like look around and look for structure. The objects are color coded by temperature as well here, or color coded, sorry, by their color, which is a proxy for maybe what temperature that they are. Uh, and as we're kind of shifting around here, um, I think there's so much exciting science in here, but to get down into it, we need to break this up into subsets. So let's take yet another visual flight. The last two were just the buildup a buildup to showing how the solar neighborhood has been filled in 
through an astrometric survey of recent years. And there's so much exciting science we can tease out of here. In order to investigate a specific question regarding where the star formation process ends and the planetary formation process begins, we must look at subsets of this data. So we're going to begin with the 20 parsec sample. Uh, and this video is going to take me a second to set up. This is going to be only the spatial distribution of the Gaia DR2 mapped 20 parsec sample supplemented by several ground and space based programs that were going after the coldest compact sources that Gaia just simply can't get because it's an optical survey that doesn't go deep enough to reach cold compact sources like cold brown dwarfs. Gaia DR2 has within the 20 parsec sample 5,400 objects. I have eyeballed every single one of them as they are not all real. There's a lot of astrometric garbage that exists in the galactic plane and because of the large and small Magellanic clouds. So let's move around this. Um, let's move around this structure a little bit. And these objects are color coded by their position on a color magnitude diagram. So the red objects are cooler objects and the yellower objects are warmer objects. I'm going to fold these objects from their spatial distribution, which is not all that interesting necessarily, a couple of binaries in here. I'm going to fold this on to a color magnitude diagram. And this color magnitude diagram, which is showing you the absolute G band magnitude versus the G minus RP color. So these are the Gaia colors and the Gaia absolute magnitude gives you an exquisite first view at what the HR diagram looks like for the nearby sample. Let's talk about what's in here. Um, you probably saw some objects exit stage left in the distribution. They're going to come back in a second as I'm going to morph through a couple of different color magnitude diagrams. What's collapsed onto this CMD here is white dwarfs. You can see in their position on the lower left here. And then the main sequence of stars running from the higher mass FGK stars. Guy didn't do the greatest job with the brightest stars, so those still need to be filled in a little bit more up there. Down into these red objects at the bottom here at G minus RP, between a red word of 1.5 or so, that's when you start entering the brown dwarf territory. Uh, there's so much good stuff on here on a color magnitude diagram. I could talk about color magnitude diagrams all day, but I think that that's not necessarily the best keynote. The, um, you can see, you can see the, the, the fine detail to the position. There's a binary sequence that you can see above the main sequence. There's young objects that are scattered within, within here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to morph into two different color magnitude diagrams using these same points. And you'll see a couple of objects exit left again, because now I'm going to match them to the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer Telescope because that, what that gives us is access to the flux that would be coming out from the coldest compact objects that are on here. And I'm gonna switch this here into absolute G versus G minus W2. The W2 band is the four and a half micron band, which is uh, in, in the WISE survey, which was um, positioned almost specifically to locate the coldest compact sources that can form through the star formation process or the coldest brown dwarfs. And in this figure that's now morphed, the white dwarfs have taken their spot below the main sequence. And this extra scatter plus this kind of interesting differentiation that you see redward of G minus W2 of four is um, giving you some inside information on some of the atmospheric characteristics of some of these colder objects in here. And I'll bring that back up towards the end. But I'm going to morph into one last color magnitude diagram here, and that's going to be only wise colors. And that's going to let me bring in the objects that Gaia couldn't do, uh, but, but are part of the big picture that I want to tell you about for the solar neighborhood. And so we're going to morph back out and exiting in stage, uh, from stage left comes in the coldest compact sources uh, that we've measured outside of Gaia. So here's this color magnitude diagram where you can see stars and white dwarfs, they kind of hang out in sort of a boring line straight down in W1 minus W2 or three and a half minus four and a half micron color of zero. But right around when you get to an absolute magnitude of 13 or so in W2, objects take a hard right. 
And they do this in their W1 minus W2 color because the flux starts to shift far out into the mid-infrared or dominantly out to the mid-infrared. And that's because their temperatures drop down to the place where atmospheric chemistry changes them so that you're seeing a different kind of object. These are the coldest compact sources that form through the star formation process. Let's talk about those objects in detail now, because that's the story I want to pick up upon. Um, and in part, how these objects have been discovered and the numbers in which that we've discovered them because they will help tell the story of the end of the star formation process and the beginning of the or possibly the beginning of the planet formation process so these coldest compact sources those reddest objects on the cmd they have also been the most difficult to discover in this 20 parsec sample a few critical points about them um, they are the end of the spectral sequence that we have currently defined for stars we call them wide dwarfs, so they're the extension of L, uh, LT in, that we um, consistently think of for brown dwarfs has been extended there. Their temperatures span from what we can estimate from their parallaxes on top of this photometry that we have and their spectra, that they're probably 400 degrees Kelvin or so or cooler. Uh, and we don't have dynamical masses for them, but when we turn to the models based on their luminosities and the possible distribution of ages, you're looking at sources that are really just a couple Jupiter masses, maybe 20 or so Jupiter masses. And that covers kind of the age that we would expect any sample in the galactic field to be. They've been so difficult to discover because they don't give off much light at all. Uh, and the, the light that they do give off, it comes in these longer infrared wavelengths. Uh, so they're, they're the true markers of the bottom of the star formation process or the top of the, the planet formation process. And this montage of jumping orange dots is showing you some recent discoveries of candidate wide dwarfs uh, from a team that I've been working with uh, on a citizen science project called Backyard Worlds Planet Nine. Uh, these posted six stamps are blinking five years worth of WISE data uh, in a 120 arc second field of view. And we've had a bit of an army of citizen scientists that have been helping us blink through images and searching for little dancing orange dots like this. They're orange because their W1 minus W2 color is basically dominated by W2 flux. They get very little flux in W1. All of the flux comes out in W2 where they have this methane feature. Uh, and the montage really highlights discoveries that are made by citizens. And now I'll, I'll answer this question later if anybody has it, but we have had to turn to blinking images because these objects are very low signal to noise, even in Ys where they're giving off a lot of their flux. And many of them, as you can see, are in some crowded ish regions. And so the human eye has been extremely important for us to try and make some discoveries. And I wanna highlight some of the folks that have been doing this, that have been helping with this project. These are some of the faces of the citizen scientists that have been working with the researchers in trying to discover these new cold compact sources that are in our very, very backyard. Uh, and while they've been finding the, the, the point of backyard worlds, colon planet nine, uh, was from my perspective, always to really navigate to a complete census of the coldest objects that are the hardest to find so that we could dive into the mass function. We could say something about the end of the star formation process. But these citizens have been so great. They've been making all sorts of other discoveries. It's led to several awesome papers. Um, I'm listing a couple of them here. And so in Backyard Worlds, we've been using our eyes to just blink objects and just go through millions of tiles to try and identify these faint, um, fast moving objects. And there's one citizen scientist on here, Dan Castleden, who I have to highlight, that also joined a subsequent project that I'm a part of called CatWise. Um, CatWise is also a catalog that you might have just recently seen has showed up on um, IPAC or on, uh, on Gator with IPAC. And that is 12 plus um, sky coverages spanning eight plus years, a full catalog that goes through, um, that lists motions and positions and new magnitudes that go deeper than the original Y survey. And so that can also be mined and has been mined by another team that I'm a part of to try and map out more of these coldest compact objects that exist in the nearby solar neighborhood. 
and Dan has been particularly critical. So the first big science thing I want to tell you about is how we can take that 20 parsec sample and we can add in all of these new 20 parsec sample from Gaia. We can add in all of these new discoveries that we've made with Catwise and Backyard Worlds and we can investigate the mass function. Uh, this is a plot from Kirkpatrick et al. 2019. Those Y dwarfs, the ones that were discovered, not all the ones that I just showed you that are new discoveries, ones that are new discoveries, we'll fill this in in our updated result very soon. Uh, but this is a result that was published very recently. Uh, and when you combine with the warmer sources, you can look at the space density of these cold compact objects within 20 parsecs. The X axis here is showing you the effect of temperatures as we've derived it from the luminosities and we've binned it by 100 degrees Kelvin. And the Y axis is showing you the resultant space um, density that you get for each bin. Uh, three scenarios were investigated as to whether the low mass end of the star formation process can be differentiated between a one Jupiter mass, a five Jupiter mass, or a 10 Jupiter mass cutoff. And as you can see, that last bin, that last bin over on the far right with the lower limit on it, is particularly critical at differentiating between the various scenarios. Um, but the conclusion that we can draw to thus far, and not quite with all the filled in stuff that we've got from Backyard Worlds and Catwise, but that um, at minimum there's a 10 Jupiter mass cutoff to the low mass star formation. And we have some updates to this in the coming year that will shed more light on that last bin. And so I want to say that another way to approach the bottom of the star formation process is to look at co-moving companions and investigate their mass and their separation distributions. So here's another montage. I mentioned that these citizen scientists, when we asked them to find the you know, moving wide dwarfs or the moving orange dots, they then came back and kept identifying these very cold objects the, for instance, like the one on the lower left, that orange object that was moving back and forth with another source that had not been cataloged or identified by anyone previously. So they would identify serendipitously as they were blinking through images, new co-moving companions. And so this is a montage of other new discoveries that they've made. So let's get back on our virtual spaceship and look through and talk about co-moving systems in the nearby solar neighborhood and what they tell us about um, the end of planet formation or the, the, or sorry, the end of star formation or the, the start of planet formation. So this flight starts around the sun. That was the 20 parsec sample that I just turned off. And now we're kind of moving around a sample of objects that are all moving with one other source. And now I've moved time forward in incremental steps where every second, um, 100,000 years goes by. And so you are doing something that clearly the human humans can ever do, which is looking at the structure near you in family members, in these objects that are identified as co-moving. These objects are all within Gaia DR2's 100 parsec sample. This sample here roughly contains 110,000 sources. And you can see even just visually as we're looking around this flight, that there is, a, um, there is a distribution in how widely separated they are from each other. And in the colors that are on here, you can see that there's differences in the, the pairs that currently exist. Uh, so let's dig deep in here. So as I noted, looking at the mass and separation distributions of these systems might just shed some light on the formation process that sculpted them. And in this plot, I've projected separation on the x-axis and the system mass ratio on the y-axis. Uh, and this is information I've compiled with uh, my postdoc, Daniela bartolez Gagluffi, who's pictured in the corner left, um, that it's co-moving sources near the sun, like the ones that uh, we just flew around and through. So the bottom left-hand corner of this plot which is a very low mass ratio which are, uh, of, uh, of a system which are tightly bound. And the top right-hand corner of this plot 
shows near equal mass ratio that are um, at very large separations. So basically the bottom right is planetary systems and the top right is widely bound binary systems. So what happens between those corners? Uh, what happens between them is where a lot of interest is. And um, as you can see, because that's probably the transition between how planets are forming and how stars are forming. Uh, there's a lot of caveats on this plot and uh, including the masses that you have to assume to, in order to get the masses of any one of the systems is these do not have dynamical masses. There's errors in the projected separations that might be quite large and there's biases in the detection methods that went into discovering all of this that are certainly played out on this plot. But even still, I mark with a dashed line on here, uh, this area of interest that Daniela and I have been calling the highway, uh, which previous theoretical work has investigated as intriguing, as an intriguing area to investigate for the difference between say gravitational fragmentation of a system or core accretion for giant planets. And now color coded on either side of that, um, dashed line here are young giant planetary companions. Now again, the masses come from models and the separations come with their errors, uh, but we are certainly interested in looking at the distribution on this plot of both the young systems and the older systems. The age of the system is critical to determining the masses of the systems, and so you do want to know this plot in terms of how old the systems are. So yes, by looking at the distribution, you can tease out um, mass distributions and separation distributions, but you can also, let's look at the distribution of young things that are, sorry, somebody's trying to come in here, um, young things that are near the sun. All right, so this is a sidebar, but related in that the color-coded objects on that last plot were the young giant planetary systems. We want to know where the young, young structures are near the sun. So let's take a little flight through new kinematic structures in the nearby solar neighborhood and what they tell us about structures at different ages through the, the solar neighborhood. Now I'm starting with those same objects that were the co-moving sample um, and flight that I took through where every one of the dots is moving with another star. And sometimes a co-moving system is a signature of a co-evolving co-moving system and Sometimes those systems are the signature of something larger, a larger structure that you might be interested in looking at. So here we've now um, flying you out above the solar neighborhood at a bird's eye view. The only stars shown here are ones for which we have differentiated structure, uh, that they're co-moving with something else. Um, a lot of this comes from a paper by Kunkel and Covey, I think it was just last year in 2019. It's supplemented with structures that myself and Jonathan Gagne have been finding. There's a lot of really awesome work with Gaia DR2 in locating these kinematic structures near the sun. Uh, I've turned off the binaries at the center here, and now I'm once again going to move through integral steps of time at this time at a million years a second, so an irrational amount of time, but it gives you an idea of how we're determining that these structures are co-moving with each other. And in determining structures that are co-moving with each other, we can then um, look to see what their ages are, whether they are known prior um, to Gaia DR2 or not. Many of these are new structures, and we can use those to, to do a deeper dive uh, into systems within them. Because those structures are all their own isolated little areas where you could look at the mass function or you could look at individual objects and what they seem to be. Which is bringing me to my next point about the architecture of young systems near the sun. This is a montage of known objects in the Tucana, Hor Tucana Horologium Association. That was one of the closer in clumps or structures. It's roughly 40 million years old or so. It's fairly widely separated on the sky, um, very largely distributed on the sky. It's not nice and compact like the Pleiades are. But each of these objects in this montage is a system, at least the first three, not necessarily the bottom corner, I'll, I'll come to that one in a second, um, where a companion has been discovered that is right up at the boundary of where you're comfortable calling it a planet versus a brown dwarf. 
um, which is why I have at the bottom here, planet, brown dwarf, world. We don't really have a good uh, name for these kinds of systems, but we do know that these systems are definitely ones we want to investigate to see if there's any signature within them of something that tells us about how they formed. So for instance, um, AB pictoris B on the upper left here, uh, that is a K dwarf with this companion and all of the companions in here are the same temperature essentially. And all of these objects are 13 Jupiter masses. Roughly, that's model based, not dynamical masses here. And so the AB pictoris B system is 260 AU separation, a K dwarf and an L dwarf, so a, a, a pretty low mass ratio. On the right there, it's a binary M dwarf with, a, with an 80, U, 80 AU separated 13 Jupiter mass object. On the bottom left, it's a pretty low mass M dwarf, which is widely separated at um, 160 AU from the 13 Jupiter mass object. And then exact same association, you find that same 13 Jupiter mass-ish object in isolation by itself, no host star. So if you look at these objects as an ensemble, you could dig in to maybe a signature of how they formed. And if there's differences between them, there's certainly a different in mass ratio and separation among these kinds of systems. So one of the ways that we do that, or one promising way that we can do that is attempting to get at the bulk composition of the sources. So all of these objects have been directly observed and all but 0103 ABB has a spectrum. And maybe even that one has a spectrum now that I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of at this second. And these can be compared and contrasted uh, to search for an observed formation difference between them, if any can be teased out. And spectra don't really allow you to access the thermal profile of a given object. And uh, grid models uh, have struggled at doing a good job of fitting the data. Um, I mean, it doesn't, they're not great fits. You can certainly extract information, but they're not great fits. So very promising method to access the bulk compositional information that might give you the access to a trend that tells you a formation difference is using a spectral retrieval method. And highlighted here in this corner plot is from a retrieval by Ben Burningham, a close colleague of mine, who's at the University of Hertfordshire, who has written a retrieval code called Brewster, which is optimized for brown dwarfs, but it's adaptable to giant planets. Um, and the corner plot is showing you the kind of abundance ratios that you can extract from a system, but a retrieval is only as good as the question that you can ask it. And it's not a magic box that gives you answers. But if you do retrieve objects uniformly, similar with similar methods, there's, there is the ability to compare and contrast and see if you can extract or back back out information that tells you about the natal environment that they might have been in. Now I highlight in here a picture of uh, my grad student, Eileen Gonzalez. She's currently with us, but she is about to defend and um, head to Cornell as a 51 peg B fellow. Um, she's fierce. She's comfortable in her skin. I think that she's going to be the one leading us, at least I hope she's going to be the one leading us sometime very soon. So look out for her. And she's been working on retrievals of uh, various objects. And you might be seeing more of this from her when she gets to Cornell. Uh, but in order to get to the bulk compositional information, you have to get past the atmospheres of these objects, which at this border between a planet and a brown dwarf at like 13 Jupiter masses. And at a young age here, they're at a temperature where the, the atmospheres are kind of crazy. So this is a little zoom in with a video that was rendered by friends of mine at the California Academy of Sciences. Uh, and it zooms in on a rendition of what one of these objects might look like. It's very reminiscent of uh, Jupiter and what Jupiter might look like. So um, recent results from even my own research have looked into these younger objects having thicker clouds. Uh, and you can think of them like hot, like Jupiters, with, which are warmer than Jupiter, but probably have similar red spots. Maybe they have banding from pole to pole. And so we really want to look at the dynamic nature of how the clouds change. Yes, you'd want to retrieve and get that atmospheric information out of them, but you also want to look at how their light is changing. And so um, another, another piece of work I want to highlight that I think is absolutely excellent 
for looking at the dynamic nature of these cold compact sources is the following by another postdoc um, that works with my group, Johanna Voss. And this is recent work where Johanna looked into the way that these young objects are varying in Spitzer. And she produced a really complete compilation of objects with measured amplitudes of variation and estimated ages to show the rotational evolution of low mass stars into brown dwarfs and potentially giant planets. And on this plot, which you can see on the x-axis shows age, and the y-axis shows the rotational period, the color of the objects is giving you an idea of temperature, which or spectral type, which is a proxy for temperature, which can be used as a proxy to get you an idea of what the mass might look like. You can see with increasing age, the rotational velocity of these sources increases like a figure skater pulling her arms in as she spins. And I think it's a really neat look at the evolution of these sources. So extreme angular momentum evolution is happening. You're seeing extreme cloud dynamics that are happening. And you're seeing these objects that are definitely all over the place in the solar neighborhood. So one last um, flight I'm going to take you on. And this is going to be highlighting the uh, M dwarfs. Uh, and this is going to highlight the work of my graduate student, Rocio Kimmen. And Rocio is a fourth year grad student. She's been spending her time looking at M dwarfs near the sun and figuring out their ages. And she did an excellent job of taking M dwarfs from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, figuring out their properties in Gaia, so that we could then take that and really understand what the M dwarfs near the sun um, look like and are doing. So here's a little virtual flight. We're moving away from the sun. Highlighted is really the footprint of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Every object in this video is going to be an M dwarf. And now I've turned on the 100 parsec sample from Gaia and only the objects that are M dwarfs. Um, there are, of course, hundreds of thousands of them in the 100 parsec sample. I'm going to um, turn the colors off here and then I'm going to pause in this motion because there's an important aspect of the solar neighborhood and the dominance of M dwarfs that I want to leave you as the last note of. So I'm going to move time forward. And similar to with the co-moving stars, um, I'm using increments of, in this case, 100,000 years a second moving by. And you're seeing basically the, the bulk motion of stars in the galaxy, of M dwarfs in the nearby solar neighborhood as they're moving around the galaxy. And a, um, a really important aspect is that the peak of the mass function is at M5. So M dwarfs are everywhere. And an underappreciated um, aspect of, I think, the, the evolution of the galaxy has been on the stellar flyby. Uh, recently, using Gaia DR2 data, Corin Baylor Jones took the radial velocity sample and determined what the stellar encounter rate is. Now, this was done for the Gaia DR2 sample with had radial velocities, which was largely dominated by higher mass stars. We haven't gotten a full view of what M dwarfs look like. There is a couple of M dwarfs accounted for, and so he took that into account. But the rate that he came up with, or that you can find from Gaia DR2, is that you get stellar encounters within one parsec, 19.7 um, plus or minus 2.2 every million years, you get an object that can fly closer than the closest star is to us right now. And this is a plot from Corin's paper of perihelion time versus perihelion distance. So at the center point of zero to the right are objects that are coming towards us, uh, possibly, and to the left, they're going away. And you can see there's an object that is at the million mark, mile, million year mark, um, that's almost kissing the bottom of the, the plot here. And that's because that's Gliese 710, which has a 95% probability of coming within 16,000 AU of the solar system. Now, of course, that doesn't have an impact on the inner solar system, but it's going to it's going to move close through the Oort cloud. And this is something folks have looked at, but I think it's important to realize that in the coming years, we're going to have a lot more DR2 radial velocities for M dwarfs, and they might be an underappreciated stellar flyby um, culprit of making a mess of different areas. We really need more information on how these stars are moving through uh, the galaxy. And M dwarfs are really the historians as well as the gnats flying everywhere that you can learn so much from. All right, I wanna end on the following note, which is I 
I'm giving this to you virtually from a room. I see no faces. I have no idea how immersed you are or not. This is an image taken inside of the Hayden Planetarium at a talk that I was giving to 400 people in the general public about the same guy, DR2 maps, mapped through chemistry that actually um, a uh, colleague helped me create from Apogee and Galah data. Uh, I would love to see us take this kind of tour immersed in the data as visualization tools have really brought to life these three dimensional maps that we have. Um, and so someday soon, maybe, I hope that we can do this kind of talk, not virtual like this, but inside of an immersed theater like the Hayden Planetarium. We can really fly through data sets and talk about them. So I want to give special thanks to some folks that helped render some of these visuals at various planetariums, Adler, Morrison, and the American Museum of Natural History. And of course, the European Space Agency's DPOC team for creating Gaia DR2. And then um, my research group, Kelly Cruz, Emily Rice, and I have been running Brown Dwarfs in New York City for the past couple of years. And this is the showcase of phases. I didn't get to showcase everybody's science, uh, but these are faces I hope that you get to see in uh, coming meetings. So I'll put my conclusion slide up. Solar Neighborhood can help us answer some of the most basic and important questions about star and planet formation. Individual objects are close enough to study in detail, and they're a laboratory for studying atmospheres of extrasolar worlds, and that this multi-dimension nature of stellar catalogs is highly complemented by visualization tools that we should all think about using. And I'll stop there and take any questions that Jeff can throw at me. You Thanks, Jackie. Great talk. Great, great ride. And um, we've already got 12 questions written in. Um, I encourage everyone to write more questions. We're going to take as much time as we need to answer your questions. So uh, let's see here. Um, from Jim Schweitzer, great talk, Jackie. Does open space have a feature to show travel process relativistically, i.e. with aberration and Doppler shifts? Oh, and Jim Schweitzer, who was at the Rose Center when we opened, and so he knows planetarium software very well. Um, the open space, as uh, Jim might know, but I'm not sure if everybody knows, was software that was really developed for a planetarium. It wasn't developed for the kind of science usage that I like to use it for and that I was trying to use it for in here. And so the increment moves the moves time forward in a very, very basic way. So um, I can't remember what he was asking about relativistic, but the tool within open space is extremely basic in what it can do to move anything forward. And it does not take into account, for instance, gravitational potential or interactions with other stars. I'm literally just pretending that I can propagate a total velocity forward over a set amount of time. We've got a question from J.H. Miller, a uh, double question. One, uh, can we say what the cutoff is between planets and brown dwarfs? And second, I assume JWST will make it much easier to find cool brown dwarfs. Yeah, so um, we have no way to differentiate between um, a low mass brown dwarf or a high mass planet, or even if that's even meaningful to differentiate between the two in terms of a mass, say. What we really want to be able to do is say what the formation mechanism was that created the object, because that's a meaningful aspect of the physical evolution of the source. Um, so 13 Jupiter masses is the designation between when a source can have stable hydrogen burning versus not, and 75 Jupiter masses is um, the boundary between stable hydrogen, sorry, between hydrogen burning and not. So you either have 75 Jupiter masses at hydrogen burning and roughly 13 Jupiter masses at deuterium burning. But all that tells you about is the intrinsic nature of the object, not necessarily about formation or much else about it. JWST is going to be a critical instrument for studying the known objects. I'm not sure what it'll do for discovery uh, since it's a very, as many of us know, it's a lot of overhead and pointing. You can't just sort of scan the sky and finding new ones of these things has required us to scan the entirety of, you know, 360 degrees of sky. JWST is the instrument that we're going to go to in order to characterize all these new discoveries. So for those of you that are going to be on, on attack, you'll see that we're going to be putting in all of these objects as the 
best targets that JWST can point at because they're cold, they're near the sun, and they're gonna have really interesting physics that uh, you can tease out through that spectra JWST will give us. So uh, William Waller asks, uh, how do you date these co-moving systems? Low mass stellar objects tend to be very old because they have such long lifetimes. Yeah, so um, as many people probably know, age dating stars is one of the most difficult things that we try and do. And uh, there's various diagnostics that we can tease out of certain kinds of stars. Solar type stars are a little bit easier. The um, astro seismology gives us some interesting age diagnostics for giants. White dwarfs give you some age dating information. For the most part, uh, anytime we've looked at these co-moving systems, um, we break them down into those kinds of categories. When it's just a regular field star, there's not too much that we can say. Uh, gyrochronology is certainly helpful, but is not, is, is, is not bona fide or fully calibrated so that it can give us great ages. But for a low mass object, like a brown dwarf, you, it, we have very little ability to get to the age. We don't have many diagnostics at all. And so when you find them co-moving with something that at least has a better shot at it, like a white dwarf or a giant or an object for which you can get gyrochronology, that can give you some inside information, making the co-moving system with a low mass companion a benchmark. The other ones that I was showing though, moving groups and young stellar associations, those are great because that's a collection of objects, all of which have the same age. So co-moving association within, like a binary that's found within a moving group or a star forming association is a super win-win-win in my book. Because you've got the pair, you can look at them for what they tell you about each other, and then you can use the whole of the kinematic structure to get really nice ages. But that is capped really for the low objects, low temperature objects that I'm talking about at just a couple hundred million years because we can't see them very far away from the sun and there are not very old collections of co-moving stars that are age dated that brown dwarfs can possibly be associated with because they're they're just too far away. Uh, Neil Sharma asks, uh, when the stellar flyby happens uh, within our Oort cloud, what are the possible ramifications for our own solar system? Yeah, so um, I'll just go back in here to this plot because I love this plot um, the, by Corin. Uh, so Gliese 710 is the one that's in, that's the one that I was describing as kind of almost kissing the bottom of the plot here, which is in about a million years. So the ramifications of that object, which is a K, it's a K star, I think it's a K, it's a mid K dwarf. And um, this has been looked at. It was looked at and has been known about since Hipparchos. As far as the literature goes on it, I believe that the impact is going to be minimal to what we can understand it, it, it's going to do based on current modeling. Um, that said, one thing I would focus on with it is that we now know that all of these objects have solar systems, or at least we think like everything in our solar system, right? So let's prep for this kind of thing. We should be staring at Gliese 710, searching for its planetary system. Because I'd like to know not just about how the star is gonna interact, but we might have its Oort cloud is gonna interact with our Oort cloud situation. I don't know what the answer really is, uh, but I think this needs more investigation for any of these stellar flybys. And uh, just a related question, um, as far as observation goes, how would such a close encounter with the stellar body help our own understanding of stars if we're able to observe at such close quarters? Can we say it again? How would the stellar flyby? Basically, we're just going to be able to see a star so close uh, and its planetary system, obviously, that we could do very detailed observations. Yeah, you know, I I like the I like to think about the, you know science fiction aspect of, of the future, that's going to be a solar system that flies right up close to us, potentially. That's why I'm saying, like, let's find the planets around Gliese 710 right now. Let's find them. And then we can start talking about what it has. It's got some hot Jupiters. What does it have? Is it close in Earth-sized planets? Is it far off uh, giant companions? 
what has it got? And uh, you know, in a science fiction, these this is the the sample is coming to us, and we're headed towards it. That said, though, it's not the only stellar flyby. I think this is just the one that we know is going to happen in a million years. We have great details on it. I didn't mention, but I was I was alluding to it with M dwarfs. Um, there was a couple years ago a discovery made from the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer by Rolf Didier Schultz, an object that was close by, like 14 parsecs, and Actually, no, I think it's closer. I think it's seven parsecs. That was just kind of nearby, but not doing much. Uh, but it had been missed. So you put it out there, and then Eric Mamachek looked at it. It's like an M7 or an M8. And it's got a little brown dwarf moving with it. And Eric looked at it, saw the radial velocity, and found that the object uh, was moving directly opposite of the solar system, which is the, which is the exact signature of an object that flew through our solar system. And so you trace back 70,000 years ago, this object, which is now known as Schultz's star, came flying through. Um, and that was an M dwarf that nobody even knew about until Wise. So what else is there to, to look for in this? I'm not sure, but when Oumuamua came careening through, the first thing on my mind was disruptions for other solar systems because you get things dislodged due to stellar flybys. I'd like to know what the rate of stellar flybys is so that we'd be able to see how much material gets tossed and flies around into the intergalactic neighborhood. Uh, uh, Tim Hallett asks, uh, how many brown dwarfs uh, are, and IR sources are, have well-constrained radial velocities? Oh, um, so radial velocities are very hard to measure for brown dwarfs. You have to have targeted surveys where you would get, say, a high-resolution infrared spectrograph on a big glass telescope. So you have to look to folks that have gotten, say, um, Keck time. Um, I'm going to pull the number out of my feel brain for thinking of objects. And I'd say that, for, for we don't have a good definition of brown dwarf, but I'll give like L dwarfs, T dwarfs, certainly Y, y dwarfs don't have radial velocities yet because they're too faint. There's no instrument that can do that right now. Even T dwarfs is a bit tricky. Uh, late type T dwarfs for certain. So I'd say there's probably a hundred to maybe 200 are in the category of like mid, uh, mid L dwarf or so and later. Um, I have certainly targeted specific brown dwarfs to get their radial velocity. The ones that I've targeted are ones that I suspected were young because I wanted their full kinematics. I, I wanted their full uh, astrometry so that we could say yes or no to their total velocity being a member of a group or not. So from that perspective, you know, we've, um, my 2016 paper has radial velocities for the young sample in it. And that accounts for, I think, probably 40 objects, maybe. But there've been other targeted surveys as people have, have, have looked for radial velocity variations that might be indicative of a companion. It's just, you need big glass. So it's a little bit tricky. Uh, Steve Qualler asks, do you learn much about the structures and dynamics by running the time backwards? Yes, I didn't show any of that. Uh, I should have had a, I should have popped up another video for you guys uh, that showcases some of this. I always run time both forward and backwards whenever I'm looking at things. And I should say, um, we do that because yes, we could sit on our computers and make our two dimensional plots and try and make a three dimensional plot. and you know, write the correct amount of code that'll spit out an answer for us. There's nothing like watching it. There's nothing like being inside of a visualization or being inside of the map and integrating forward, but then integrating backwards. Like backwards is as good to me as forward is to me because we're not living linearly when it comes to our studying of the universe. So in moving backwards, sometimes with the moving groups and the young star associations, I look for, you know, interactions between young things. So you move time forward or backwards and you look to say, what was the Pleiades interacting with 100,000 years ago? Or sorry, like 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. Is there anything in there? Um, a couple million years, you can see a lot of really interesting, what I've been seeing is weird kind of car crash uh, looks that seem to happen with young star forming areas. It's super fun to do this. It almost feels like you're playing within a video game, but there's, there's lots of scientific stories that you're pulling out uh, by visually looking at the data that we usually are just 
playing with in XYZ plots. So kind of related to this, can you comment on using open space with VR? Yeah, I get asked about VR a lot um, and I'm not as invested in VR. Um, open space can certainly be used in VR, but I find that VR takes away some of the scientific collaboration that you have when you're within like a planetarium dome and looking at data or even on like a large screen and showing off some of the data sets. And um, what I mean by that is VR, you've got your headset on. Uh, it can also be kind of, um, it's definitely more physical. I'm one that, for instance, gets a little bit of a uh, head sick when I'm kind of inside of a VR set. Uh, and more than that, the Gaia DR2 data doesn't really require it. I'd really rather just kind of fly in what gets mimicked as three-dimensional space when you're still looking at a flat screen. Um, VR is excellent for certain things though, and I should promote that in Cape Town at the planetarium there, the various folks who work at the planetarium are working with some of the scientists on the SKA, and they've been building some virtual reality modules to look through SKA data cubes so that they can really navigate around that huge amount of data and structure in order to see within it and outside of it, because they really want the three-dimensional structure. I just want to fly around the stars. Um, Ambish Pratik uh, asks, um, what's the primary composition of brown dwarf atmospheres and how um, complicated mo molecules have been detected in them? So um, starting from the higher mass brown dwarfs, and we're really, I'll just give a temperature range because defining them as brown dwarfs or as stars also gets a little bit tricky. At like 3000 degrees Kelvin or so, you can get a temperature. It's too hot for the condensation of species. As you get lower, so go lower, um, which can still be a star and not necessarily a brown dwarf because they overlap due to a degeneracy between the age and the mass. Um, of the object, but let's pretend that they're all brown dwarfs. As you get to cooler temperatures, you get the condensation of really interesting species. You can get uh, liquid iron droplets. We talk a lot about um, the silicate clouds that exist so that you can have corundum, uh, phosphorite, enstatite, crystalline features like that. When we do these retrievals, we're trying to get the exact nature of the kind of cloud structure that might be there. Uh, as you get to cooler objects, so that's kind of the warmer region at like 2000 degrees Kelvin or so, 2200, you go into like 1000 degrees Kelvin and lower, you start to lose those clouds and it becomes dominated by methane gas. Ammonia comes in and becomes an, an interesting opacity source. And then you get down into the coolest temperature objects where you look at um, sulfide clouds as well as um, sulfide and salt clouds as well as water ice clouds that become all mixed up in the outer photosphere that you can try and extract information on. So you move through these like hot, seemingly bizarre um, silicate clouds into things that look a lot like what we see on Jupiter or Uranus and Neptune, the outer gas giant planets. As a very analogous objects. Um, I should say everybody should look at this paper that Brittany Miles just led that looks at the mid-infrared data, mid-infrared spectra of a series of Y dwarfs and looks at the uh, various model checks on what the cloud structure might be and also the mixing ratio of various abundances. So check out Brittany's paper that uh, came out was probably like three or four months ago. Um, I've been looking into some things on Uranus and it was striking me how similar when they study kind of towards more of the interior of Uranus, how similar it is to some of the issues that we were looking at in that paper at the cloud structure of the coldest compact sources outside of the solar system. Uh, Jackie, a couple of people have asked you just, can you just name the object again, the one that's kissing the bottom of the diagram uh, that's going to come by in about a million years and, and do we know its spectral classification? Yep, it's Gliese 710 and it's a K dwarf. I think it's a mid K dwarf. Um, Galactic Times asks, uh, over your choice of time period, how many objects have you, do you see in your data that 
have recently passed through the solar system and how many objects do you see that are on the way towards us? Well, this is the exact plot to, um, to look for in that. And uh, it's giving you perihelion distance on the y-axis and perihelion time on the x-axis. So if you were to draw a line straight down the middle at zero, everything to the right is an object that's coming towards us and everything to the left is an object that was near us and has since already done its flyby. What's important here also is that the better the astrometry, the better you can get at deriving a plot like this. So you can see the error bars here are quite large for some objects. And um, uh, as soon as DR3 comes out, which again, this, this plot is just the 7 million objects or 7 point whatever objects, 7 point whatever million objects in the DR2 sample. But DR3, which is currently delayed, but when it comes out, it's supposed to have 30 million radial velocities in it. So a major uphaul on objects. And when that happens, I think we will see a, this plot's gonna get filled in even more. So we're gonna see far more structure to this. And once we get the M dwarfs in here, this is me speculating, but there's no way M dwarfs don't do some serious amounts of flying by. So this is kind of a related question. Um, even within the, the five part, within five parsecs of our solar system, what's the completeness right now of uh, the known brown dwarfs? Uh, so this is something I've talked to. Davy Kirkpatrick is really the one that, um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put it on this plot because I really like this animation that uh, was made by Mark Subaral and Aaron Geller for me. This was the 20 parsec sample. Uh, we've been trying very hard to get at the 20 parsec sample. We're certainly not complete in here. Davey has done quite a bit of work previously, as well as Todd Henry and the recons group on the eight parsec sample. How complete are we? I actually feel uncomfortable saying, because as soon as I say I think we're complete to a certain spectral type, I know somebody's gonna make a discovery and we will not actually be complete. So um, I would say one thing Davey and I have talked about uh, is that within eight parsecs, what's super interesting is that K dwarfs are pretty dominant, but T dwarfs are giving the K dwarfs a run for their money when it comes to number in sheer number. So that might be because the brown dwarfs move through the L dwarf phase fairly quickly before they get to the T dwarf phase. And so, um, so we, don't have, we don't have a perfect sentence on LT or Y right now, but we're certainly looking within eight parsecs at a, a pretty nice sample out to probably mid T. Um, so we've sort of reached the end of our time. Um, ben, are we uh, having a hard cutoff? Uh, the meeting's scheduled for another eight minutes, so you should have uh, some extra time if you want to do a few more questions. Okay, I just got one more here. Um, have there been any brown dwarfs discovered in the Goldilocks zone of another star? In the habitable zone? Yeah. Um, no, that's, uh, oh, I said that very quickly. I want to say no, um, but my brain has to calibrate on what distance that would be. So there is, of course, a brown dwarf desert, which is, if you look close into a star to try and find companions, at a certain, um, at a certain separation, you stop finding brown dwarf companions. And if you look back on the 51 peg B paper, the original one by, um, uh, by Michelle Mayor and DDA Kalo, What's very interesting is that goes to 1995. And in 1995 was also the year that Gliese 229b, which is a brown dwarf companion, was discovered. And in that paper, which I've just had some students reread, what's interesting is the discussion about what that object might be, because 51 peg b is a hot Jupiter. And at that point in 95, we didn't realize that that kind of uh, architecture could exist. 
And so there's a good conversation on there of, in that paper about whether or not it's a brown dwarf pulled in very close to the star and, um, and getting disintegrated so that you're, you're getting them stripped and ripped away. Um, I said that very quickly about them not being in the habitable zone, but it could very well be, that's a very specific range in space um, around a star. And I'd have to look at the distributions, but you do not find many brown dwarfs close to, um, to say FGK stars. Okay, Jackie, we're gonna wrap this up. Thanks very much for doing this. And uh, it's, it's great to see you. Um, please take care and um, with everything. And uh, thanks again. Thanks. And thanks anybody who's still out there watching.